Okay, so we'll start. Maybe some more over then. Um, Dr. DeSantis is here again with us from Erie, Pennsylvania, and he's going to continue his uh, lessons on from temple to table, changing place and practice of Christian worship. And then in, uh, we'll be doing it this week and next week, and then on the 23rd, he'll be concluding with a lesson on his uh, real strong interest in the crash. Get it right there? Yes. Yeah. Uh, for those of us that don't know that word, use that word, the nativity scene. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to read a little bit of his bio. I know most of I think all of you were here last week, but I'll, in case there's people tuned in that weren't, I'll read a little bit of his bio. But after I read his bio and before we've been talking, I'd like to ask a question of you, Dr. Sankus. Sure. Uh, because I didn't leave the choir and last week was able to watch the end, but when I got home, because he's allowed us to record it, it's been great. I tuned in on the website and saw the end of it, and then I had a question that I wanted to ask him. So I'm going to ask it before we get started. It's okay. <clears throat> so um, Michael DeSantis is a PhD, retired recently from fine arts and theology at Deanna University in Erie, Pennsylvania. Although he said he is doing a lot of consulting work and just retired from teaching at Deanna. Not really retired, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> He is a member of the Commission of Sacred Art and Architecture for the Diocese of Erie and has established an international reputation for his work as a liturgical educator, designer, and consultant. To date, Dr. Sankas has been involved in more than 80 architectural projects for Christian communities throughout the United States. He is an active supporter of ecumenical dialogue and serves on the board of Interchurch Ministries for Erie, Pennsylvania of which you would have been very proud of us this week, which I sent you some photos of what we did That's on right. Tuesday night and Wednesday morning, where we gathered at the Catholic Church for the Jewish temple to have their Yom Kippur meetings. And about 20 of us, I think, or more maybe, were lined up out front as Protestant Christians to worship, to bring them in and welcome them to their services. It was really emotional for me. And I thought really uh, just a neat support of the community. For a group that uh, goes, they have to do a lot to go to church. They got to sign into the computer. They got to get a barcode. They got to go through security security checks of purses before they can go to church. Imagine what our church would look like if we did that. Few <laughs> <laughs> work people out there. Plus, their services all day. Can you imagine anybody going to an all day service? No. I, I keep telling them it, this would never happen. <laughs> <laughs> Can I just say thank you to everybody who came? I mean, you guys were the ones who made it. Oh, Mary, 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 it was Mary. Mary, but it really was the fact that they were really amazed that so many people showed up, and that made a big difference. So thank you. I'm glad we could do it. So a few of us will be going to choir uh, early again, and Mary Lawler will be closing out the meeting this morning. Um, so the question I had, yes. you, you compared the the crosses of the Protestant church and the Catholic church, where the, in Catholic churches, when you go inside the church, Jesus is always on the cross, mm -hmm. mostly on the cross. Uh, in Protestants, you don't see that. In jewelry, jewelry, the same thing. So my question is, is why on the exterior of the Catholic church is Jesus not on the cross? Because I don't think I've ever seen a Catholic church where Jesus is not, where it's just the cross, like your church, a 40-foot cross on top. Right, right, right. Um, you can find Catholic churches that have what we call the crucifix, where the corpus or the, the lifeless body of Christ is there on the cross, even in, in an exterior uh, presentation. Um, I recently did a church project about two hours from Erie, Pennsylvania, in a place called Warren, Pennsylvania, and uh, it was called Holy Redeemer Church, and they put a very large crucifix on the exterior. And you folks especially um, certainly know the theology, the theological difference, right? If you ask any card-carrying Protestant, why don't you have the corpus or the body of Christ on the cross in the church? Your answer would be, well, we celebrate the resurrected Christ. Actually, interestingly, Dale, I'm glad you asked this question. In the church where my wife and I and my family worship, we have 
a cross hanging above the altar on airplane wire uh, with air, the help of airplane wire. And um, it's a resurrected Christ. And I know when that building was originally constructed in the 1970s, a lot of folks, a lot of Catholics, died in the wool Catholics said, oh, that looks far too Protestant. We don't want that resurrected Christ there. Um, but of course, of course, it, um, we all celebrate the resurrected Christ. Um, I, I guess the point that I tried to make last week is that in the Catholic imagination, the service that we call the mass, and uh, the word mass comes from the Latin word, which means dismissal or mission. Um, you folks talk about the great commission, right? Being sent forth from your service as the body of Christ to help redeem the world. Well, we do the same thing as Roman Catholics. We come together for an event called the mass, misa in Latin, which is a dismissal at the very end of the service. The priest says, go, this is the end of the mass. And we are dismissed to help convert the rest of the world. And uh, in our church building, we certainly um, celebrate the resurrected Christ as you do. I guess the great scandal is that we as the members of Christ's body are still part of a fractured body, right? Uh, you folks might call yourselves Protestants, although that's kind of an outdated phrase nowadays. My wife and I call them ourselves Roman Catholics, and it's sort of sad and tragic that we don't celebrate together at the end of every week. It's a scandal to the rest of the world. And um, in my lifetime, because I'm 65, what I have found is that Roman Catholics have begun to really appreciate the significance of the word, Christ's presence in the word of God. And what I find, too, is that Protestants are beginning to realize the fact that you can't have a disembodied religion. Religion needs to be embodied in symbol and gesture and beauty. And, and I don't know what the habit is of your community there in Manhattan Beach, but uh, I know a lot of Protestant congregations here in Erie, Pennsylvania, on Ash Wednesday, the beginning of the Lenten season, are actually having their members uh, inscribed with ashes. Uh, I know my own four kids went to vacation Bible school one summer at a Presbyterian church close by. And I went to pick them up one afternoon after they had been there for three or four hours. And the entire sanctuary of this Presbyterian church was filled with kids, all of whom had their foreheads inscribed with ashes. And I thought to myself, boy, if the Presbyterian grandparents and great grandparents of these kids could see their grandchildren inscribed with those popish, papist, Roman Catholic ashes, they'd be doing full gainers in their graves, right? But we're beginning to realize, and we're, we're beginning to come together. I like to pray that we're coming together as Christians, that again, the word is certainly important, and so is sacrament or gesture or beauty. I, I noticed from uh, looking at photographs of the sanctuary of your space that, that beauty seems to be important to you. Acoustics are important. Music is important. You, uh, you robe your, your choir, which suggests something about their importance, their significance. Um, anyways, I'm going on and on because this is my favorite topic. I love talking about the relationship between aesthetic experience and spiritual experience. I, I don't really think they can be separated anyways. Uh, but let's do this. I'm sorry, Dave. Question? Something about our particular church well, the denomination, actually. Communion is open to everyone. Right, you know? right. So that's, I mean, I think that's a significant gesture, that communion is available to anyone. Who right, there. right. Yeah, right. Yeah. Um, and I think, um, I mean, that's a very good point. Why don't Roman Catholics, for example, extend the meal from the table to everyone? And it comes down to the fact that in the Roman imagination, Eucharist is the sacrament of unity. And, and how can you offer that sacrament to everyone, given the fact that they aren't unified with this particular body? It would, it would be like having, I don't know, some organization. Oh, don't you have this group called the Mariners there? I learned about them this week. I, I have no idea what, what the Mariners are or what they do, but uh, maybe the Mariners have a certain logo, a certain sweater, a certain fez, a certain hat they wear, and distributing those symbols to everyone outside the body we call the mariners. Um, in the Catholic imagination, this, uh, this gift we call Eucharist is so precious, we don't share it with everyone. And actually the early Christians did not share the Eucharist with everyone. You know that uh, the reason why the mass, for example, is divided into two parts. Boy, I'm going way a, way a, a field from my lecture, but I'll charge you double, okay? Um, <laughs> 
the mass is divided into two parts, the liturgy of the word and the liturgy of the Eucharist. In the early church, folks who were called catechumens, who were learning their faith, they were allowed to stick around and to hear the word of God. But then the bishop, the episcopos, the presider, he would say, ite misa es, this is the dismissal. And all of you folks who are learning your faith, you have to go away because you haven't been baptized yet. And of course, they always baptized on the vigil of Easter uh, in the early church. And, and you had to be an adult. You had to make a conscious decision to become part of this illegal sect called the Christian community, the Christian tradition, I guess. And uh, then they had the, uh, the, the Mass of the Catechumens was the first part of the Mass. But then they had the Liturgy of the Eucharist, which could only be participated in by those who had already been baptized. But uh, again, uh, maybe I can tie in some of these questions or comments to uh, the discussion uh, that I want to present to you today. Let's see if I can go here. What am I doing wrong here, Kevin? Uh, so you need to select your PowerPoint window instead of the Chrome. Go here. Like go here. Uh, yeah, try presenting now and let me know if that. There works. we go. So you can see my graphic right now? Yes. yes. Fantastic. You guys are asking good questions, by the way. You're much better than my, my students at the university. I used to tell them that my solemn responsibility was to get them to question everything they learned in high school, not to necessarily agree with all that they had been told. And if I did my job well, I would leave them with more questions at the end of the semester than answers. And in some ways, I guess I want to make that um, comment to you as well. Uh, it's great to have Dale introduce me every week because he knows exactly how to pronounce my last name, De Sanctus, and I make a big deal out of that because it's um, it's a Latin name. It often causes people to kind of trip up. Uh, there's a governor in Florida, as you know right now, who's got a similar name, De Santis, but that's an Italian name. My name, my Latin name, was never translated into Italian. It means from the saints, so you can imagine that Somebody strapped with the name Michael DeSanctis can't really do too much in this life but be a liturgical consultant or designer or committed Christian. Uh, but again, I thank you, Dale, because um, my name does become problematic to some people. And several years ago, I was working with a group in Illinois. They were uh, getting ready to renovate a building that was over 100 years old. And the woman who was introducing me got really nervous on that occasion. And as she grew closer and closer to my pronouncing my last name, I knew I was in trouble. But at the end of this long sort of protracted introduction, she said to the people in this parish, ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming from Gannon University in Erie, Pennsylvania, Dr. Michael Dukakis. And um, <laughs> even I was surprised, even I was excited having never met Michael Dukakis before, who at the time was in the process of running for the presidency. So, uh, so it is DeSanctus, not Dukakis, I guess. Um, I have been thinking about you all week and I've, I was really tickled by the responses I heard um, from all of you last week. Unfortunately, from my perspective, as I look out at you on my laptop, unfortunately, you're just this little sort of postage stamp size group of folks out there in Manhattan Beach and. California, uh, but it is great to get to know you and to, to walk right into your community and to uh, spend time with you learning about our faith. One of the disadvantages that you folks had is that you weren't able to question me or correct me, and, and uh, I was correcting myself throughout the week thinking about what I had shared with you. And remember how I was rhapsodizing on the city of Florence a little bit? It's hard not to rhapsodize on this town. Many of you have visited Florence. And you know that most folks become beguiled by all the great buildings that are on the north side of that river, which I kept calling the Po. Well, the Po is the name of the valley in which you find the city of Florence. You folks all know that that beautiful river which uh, flooded its banks in 1966, and many of you are old enough to remember that, isn't called the Po, it's called the Arno. Well, if you go to the south side of the Arno, or what the uh, Florentines call L'Artrano, the other side of the Arno, there's a building that I did take you to, a big old basilica in that section of town designed by Brunelleschi, who was one of the great fathers uh, of uh, Renaissance architecture. 
And the reason I wanted to take you to this church called Santo Spirito uh, Church, Holy Spirit Church, uh, was just to point out the fact that during the Renaissance period, during the 14th, 15th, 16th century, a period of great uh, infatuation with the human race, the human person, the scale of church buildings comes down to the scale of the human person. I know that this building might look a lot larger than yours or mine, but uh, even from the interior, what you see is that Brunelleschi going all the way back to the Roman Basilica, which we'll talk about today, brings the ceiling plane closer to the floor plane and, and kind of inflates our scale. Uh, the word scale uh, has to do with the size of an object uh, in comparison with the human body. And isn't it funny that we still measure architectural space in feet or arms lengths or so many heads tall? We use our bodies as a metrical system for measuring space. And what I was doing was comparing uh, that kind of Renaissance approach to church architecture with the great Gothic cathedrals that we see all over Europe that have ceilings so far above our head. Uh, and they have the effect of making us feel very, very small in God's kingdom. Somebody uh, in the discussion last week at the very end brought up the question of Romanesque architecture, which is a fascinating topic. And uh, typically when you see a Romanesque church building like the one I pictured here, uh, they have to use time-lapse photography to photograph the interior of the space because um, these buildings are so dark uh, that without natural, um, without artificial illumination and the help of time, it would be difficult to see these, uh, these interiors. Uh, and some of you know that the, these Roman-like or Romanesque buildings are really heavy and ponderous. Uh, their ceilings, at least, are based upon the physics of what we call a barrel vault. And in turn, upon the physics you and I learned about in grade school or high school uh, physics class, having to do with the structure of, of an arch. We all learned that gravity pulls upon that keystone, which in my little illustration is colored blue. And because it's a trapezoid, because it's a wedge, it really can't go anywhere. And so the keystone translates uh, gravitational downward pull into an outward push, into thrust. Well, that's easy enough for me to do in my little computer graphic here, but if you're throwing up a ceiling vault that's 50 feet wide, 100 feet wide, you can imagine the amount of lateral or outward pushing that the building would generate. So consequently, the folks of the 11th century, uh, 10th century would have to compensate by making the walls of a church building incredibly thick, like the tan colored walls I put in my little graphic. And the windows had to be really small because windows don't really, have, glass windows don't have too much compressive strength. Consequently, the interiors of these buildings were exceedingly dark. And the photograph I popped into my PowerPoint for you shows you what the interior of a typical Romanesque building would look like. What I'd ask, ask you to do, in fact, is to kind of sear into your imagination that little screen you see at the far end of this building that divides what Catholics would have called the nave from the sanctuary. I know that in Manhattan Beach, for example, at Community Church, you refer to the entire interior of your worship space as sanctuary, based upon the fact that all of you, having been incorporated into the body of Christ, make that space sacred by your presence. In the Catholic imagination, based upon precedents coming all the way from the temple in Jerusalem, there's the idea that the lay people hang out in the nave space, and that's fairly sacred. But even more sacred is the Holy of Holies or the sanctuary that's up front that is accessible only to the clergy. The people of the 12th century, 13th century also understood the physics of an arch, and they figured out, partly by stealing this idea from other cultures, that if you point the arch just a little bit, you can direct those lateral thrusts more clearly downward. And that allowed them to build much taller walls, much thinner walls, and walls that were pierced with huge uh, expanses of glass. I mean, some of the interiors of Gothic churches are exceedingly tall. Some of you have been to Chartres, for example. The Cathedral of Chartres has a ceiling that's 128 feet above the heads of the lay people. At Beauvais Cathedral, which I'll be taking you to in just a second, the tallest of all Gothic cathedrals in the world, 
the interior ceiling, not the roof or anything or the spires up above, but the interior is almost 150 feet above the heads of lay people. The predicament they had is that even though they were building their churches out of stone, at that height, when the winds would press themselves against the walls, the building would tend to rack. It would tend to twist back and forth like Chubby Checker. Now, kids <laughs> in my class have no idea who Chubby Checker is, but they don't even know what the word flip side means. But anyways, on the flip side, or they don't even know what it means to cut a political deal in a smoke-filled room, but that's beside the point. <laughs> True. What the people of the middle, middle Ages did was to either put big masses on this structure the way I did with my computer, or much more aesthetically appealing, they would build those masses, those piers, and have them stand away from the building itself, and then attach these arches called flyers to the exterior, and kind of uh, use these bookends, these architectural bookends that we call flying buttresses, uh, to stiffen the building, the structure of the building. As I told you, I think uh, last week, I always used to like to connect these structures to biology for my students, most of whom were in the sciences, interestingly enough, and partly to show them that the sciences and the arts are complementary to each other. And so I would remind them that a Gothic cathedral really has an exoskeleton. It's like an insect or a crustacean. All the hard parts, all the bony parts are on the exterior as opposed to the interior. When you and I build a skyscraper today, we build a skeleton of steel on the inside, and then we wrap a skin around that, a dermis around that to keep things out of the organs of the building. In the old days, they would build the bones first and then the walls would go up. Here's that cathedral at Beauvais I mentioned to you, the tallest Gothic cathedral in the world. They got to a height of 150 feet in, in terms of its vault and the thing exploded outward. So they had to leave it just as it was. They sealed up the big place where the explosion took place. And to this day in the town of Beauvais in France, they use only the chancel part of the building, the part that would have been reserved for the clergy and the choir at the time. And um, like many of you, I grew up with the great tradition of NASA um, as part of the mythology of my family, of our nation. I, I really think that the... Um, uh, NASA has been responsible for giving us great mythic images to think about. Even though we've gathered certainly a tremendous amount of scientific data and information from the space shots and the moon shot and so forth, um, it seems to me that something like a Saturn V uh, rocket is, is comparable in so many ways to what the, the great builders of the Gothic cathedrals were doing. Uh, we used our, our empirical imaginations, our logical imaginations, we used our science to give us these incredible spacecraft that lifted us off uh, the, the planet Earth and sent us to someplace uh, celestial. Uh, the folks of the Middle Ages um, used their, their analogical imaginations. And what I mean by that is the, the people of the Middle Ages thought analogically. They, they thought that the life that you and I lead on this planet is a symbol, uh, a sign, an analogy for the kind of lives that we'll lead someday on the other side of the grave. None of us in this room, none of us here this morning has ever seen the other side of the grave. Uh, in, that, in our imaginations, we try to picture things the way they might be here on earth. Uh, some of you have been lucky enough to go to a town like Milan in the northern part of Italy, and you've seen the great cathedral in Milan that was begun during the Middle Ages and never finished until the 19th century. It's like a great compass needle or a compilation of compass needles that points to the sky, points to the heavens. Um, to get back to the question that Dale put to me about crucifixes and crosses, in some ways it's an architectural symbol of the resurrection. It tells us that Christ, yes, was embodied uh, in the person of Jesus on this planet for 33 years. He destroyed death, and we have to look heavenward. And of course, in the Middle Ages, to look heavenward was to look upward. And um, if you think about it even more uh, fully, you have to say to yourself or conclude that probably everything that we say about God, this God we believe in, is analogical, is an analogy, beyond acknowledging that a God exists, as you and I do in our creed. We believe that there is a God. Probably all the language we use to describe this God 
is analogical. I mean, even Jesus tells us to refer to God as Father. Well, he's like a father. He's like a divine, divine father. And, and even though many of us, when we go to bed at night and say our prayers, might imagine God as looking like this infinitely old gentleman with a lar large gray beard and fingernails and sort of floating around on cumulus clouds, we know that God exists beyond space and time, but also within space and time. He's so grand. He's so hard to comprehend. And we rely on analogies uh, symbols to understand that God or speak about him. If you have a lot of time on your hands, and if you have a really good brain, you might want to try wading through uh, the work of David Tracy. He's a, a, a theologian who teaches at the University of Chicago. I've tried about 10 times to make it all the way through this book, and I, I have failed every time because Tracy is so opaque. But he does make the point that the language you and I use is typically analogical when we speak about uh, uh, these religious matters of ours. Even Jesus did that, right? Uh, Jesus loved to use parables. Um, we learned about uh, last week uh, seeds, uh, the faith the size of a seed. You can imagine how all of this goes down uh, with my own students, the students that I taught for 35 years. Uh, and then, as you can see from this photograph, I literally taught in the presence of the cross. I taught in the shadow of the crucifix. And I, and I love my students. Um, this is probably a, a manifestation of transference or something, but I fall in love with my students every semester. And some of you might be uh, teachers or retired teachers. I really believe that great teaching is always dialogical. It's a dialogue. Jesus taught through dialogue and through parable. And unfortunately, it breaks my heart that most of my students today are unchurched. They have no connection to church which makes it nearly impossible to teach art history because if you're looking at something like Michelangelo's David, or if you're looking at Michelangelo's Sistine ceiling, um, Sistine Chapel ceiling, for example, all of that imagery comes from scripture. And the typical American college kid today doesn't go to uh, Bible school any longer, doesn't go to Sunday school, doesn't know any of those great mythic Christian stories that you and I were raised with they give form to our life. I uh, Sadly, they, they belong to a culture of what I call prematurity. And this past week, I had to buy some shop lamps, shop lights for my, my shop here at the house. And uh, I went to Lowe's and I took this photograph, thinking of all of you, to prove my point that the culture doesn't really uh, attend to the fact that there are times and seasons and cycles in our lives that some of us actually embrace as being sacred. So for the larger culture, the popular culture, Christmas has already begun. Christmas that helps us make a buck has already begun. And I think my students, unfortunately, are affected by that. Uh, the kids in my classroom, too, are affected by what I call a culture of virtuality. And this will be maybe easier for you to understand because you know as well as I do that the kids today are surgically attached to their cell phones. They are addicted to cell phone activity, and maybe even I am to a certain degree. Uh, and the kids, you know, would sneak their cell phones into my class. They would put their cell phones on their laps and try to text their friends and do so, that kind of stuff during my lectures. And, and it looks so peculiar that they were looking down at their navels half of the time. And that kind of navel gazing, unfortunately, has really taken over their culture. This book was written several years ago by a guy from uh, New York University. He argues that all of reality today is now mediated to us through the technology that surrounds us. Uh, I, I'm so concerned about this that um, I teach, uh, I actually offer, excuse me, I, I write a column once a month for the local senior news, which is nothing like a referee journal or a journal article or the kind of books that I write for a scholarly community, but it gives me the opportunity to do what I call public theology. Uh, and just this past uh, week, uh, the October uh, issue of the Senior News came out, and I've got an article where I talked about the significance of the sacredness or the sanctity of persons and places and things. Because again, my students, for example, live in a culture of virtuality, uh, which has spilled over into the church, as you know. And I suppose there's lots of really positive reasons why we have virtualized worship and church activities. Um, and the COVID pandemic, for example, was a real uh, 
a real blow to the church and we made Christ accessible to people who couldn't be together by having virtual services, just as you folks have virtual services. I've gone to your website a million times to watch how you use that wonderful tool. Um, but you have to ask yourself in a culture of prematurity and virtuality, are we even able any longer to talk about things like sacred time and sacred space, which has so much to do with who we are as, as Christians? Uh, we saw, for example, how the, uh, the Capitol building was desecrated by a bunch of folks who had forgotten, perhaps, the lessons of sacred time and sacred space. I mean, I, I, I bet none of you could ever have imagined that something like the Capitol building would be desecrated the way it was on January 6th. And I don't want to get into the politics of that. I, I have a friend who taught at the university where I taught. Uh, and even though it's a Catholic university, we had all kinds of uh, theological courses and professors. This particular colleague was actually a Baptist. And he used to like to tease me all the time because he knew how much I loved talking about sacred space. And he would say, Michael, there are no such things as sacred spaces. And I would say, Terry, well, why don't you jump in the car with me and we'll go to central Pennsylvania and I'll show you this beautiful farmland there. It's called Gettysburg. Tell me that that space isn't sacred. The space that was saturated with the blood of soldiers, thousands of soldiers, or let's go down uh, with the same car closer to Pittsburgh to a place called Shanksville, which on 9-11 became sacred space. It was uh, a space um, comparable to, equivalent to any other farmland that you could find in this country. Nowadays, it's got this big old platform, kind of a chevron shaped uh, structure, almost like Maya Lin's Vietnam Veterans, More, uh, Veterans Memorial in Washington, which you visited. And then it's got a path that was actually made by the plane that went down there, Flight 93 on 9-11, uh, where all of those people lost their lives. And when you, when you go to that farm field today, it's so quiet there. People reverence the dead. They think about and contemplate what happened there. And they treat that place as sacred. It's been made radioactive. Made, uh, it's been consecrated by the act of sacrifice that occurred there on 9-11 uh, in 2001. What does that have to do with you folks at Manhattan Beach? Um, as, as we go through some of the discussion today or presentation today, um, I'd like you to ask yourselves these questions. How do we folks define what it means to be sacred? Do we believe there really are sacred spaces or sacred people, sacred times? Or is everything kind of homogenized? The, what breaks my heart about my students is that they sort of live in, in a flat land. The, uh, life has no three-dimensionality uh, three to it. It has no mythic quality to it, except perhaps maybe sports. Sports and politics and Pop music have become the sources of mythology for kids who are 25 years old or younger. Uh, how much of what we see in our place of worship is borrowed from the past? And I hope I can point out to you even more today how much we Christians have borrowed from the past. I think off the top of my head last week, I said something like uh, the Christian church has the largest attic in the world. And it never throws anything away. Why would it throw anything away? There's no reason to reinvent the wheel. What we do is we, we take objects outside of ourselves and we consecrate them to our use. Uh, it's not just bread and wine that get consecrated. It's not just people that become consecrated and turn into something magical and mystical and supernatural. We Christians have this incredible knack of taking something that isn't sacred and sanctifying it. And then how authentically does our space our space at Community Church, convey who we are as a Christian people, a Christian community. Those of you who were with me either virtually or in uh, space uh, last week, you know, we began our little journey by talking about temples, temple architecture. And I mentioned that because um, we're going to see that Christians either held on to some of the aspects of temple worship and temple building or rejected them. Um, and just to kind of bring us up to date or to review a little of this, the people of Jesus's generation living in Roman-occupied Palestine, they certainly would have known what a Roman temple looked like. If you were to cut, a wall, cut away the wall of a building like this and look at it in section, you see that the typical Roman temple always had some kind of a cult figure or devotional figure built in it. 
some of you have been lucky enough to go to Athens, Greece and to look at the Parthenon. Well, the statue of Athena in the Parthenon was 40 feet tall, four stories tall, the height of your church building, I think. Well, these, this is a Roman temple and you see that there's a priest there, a priestly figure. The Romans used to maintain a college of priests. Priests are always involved in some kind of sacrificial activity. And you see what he's doing? He's burning incense. Outside the temple building, as I showed you last week, there would have been altars for Holocaust sacrifices. The only way you could get oxygenated blood into the bodies of these gods and goddesses was by slaughtering animals and then incinerating their, their bodies, sublimating their bodies and sending them up to the heavens. An altar is kind of like a pump. It, it pumps life's blood into the gods and the goddesses. Uh, the incense was partly there, I think, to fragrance the room and make it, uh, make it seem as if it's sacred. In some religious traditions within Christianity, we still use a great abundance of, of, um, of incense. Uh, incense was also used and sacrifices were also burned in a domestic setting within the Roman household. Um, uh, here's a, an example of a, an object called an edicula. And uh, the, the word edicula refers to like a little temple. Uh, last week I told you that uh, whenever you see that pedimented gable that has the shape of that triangle, you know that you're in the presence of something sacred. That was the architectural shorthand to the people in Roman occupied war, uh, world that uh, this really was a sacred space. And the gentleman you see in the, the little illustration is putting oblations of some kind on this little altar adjacent to the edicula. It might just be olive oil. He's, he's taking precious olive oil, the most fragrant stuff you can think of, and he's uh, putting it on this altar to sacrifice to the gods and the goddesses who oversee his family, his home. And of course, the temple in the imagination of Jews living in occupied Palestine would have been in Jerusalem, a big petrified tent. Remember last week, we talked about the fact that a temple is really a tent made out of stone. It's a human made tent. Well, we know the Hebrew people as they were walking around and during Exodus, for example, carried the Ark of the Covenant between, uh, beneath a tent or they placed it beneath a tent and they would encamp themselves, but at a distance from that tent. Well, over the years, that fabric tent became petrified or turned into a stone one, which again in section, is similar to what I just showed you uh, in that Roman uh, example. Uh, think about it in terms of plan. Here's a plan looking down upon the temple in Jerusalem, Solomon's temple, Herod's temple. You see how it's just really a bunch of uh, rectangles or squares that get consecutively smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. In religious architecture, the more significant something is or the more sacred something is, the smaller the space it contains. If you increase the space, enlarge the space, you dilute its sanctity. Well, as you all know, um, in this um, incredible temple that was so important to the G Jewish people, uh, the Ark of the Covenant uh, resided. It was built for the Ark of the Covenant. And once again, you have a priest, a high priest. Priests are always attached to altars, places of sacrifice. And even though the uh, altar of Holocaust was outside, and that's where animals would have been slayed as gifts to, to God the Father, the, the Paschal lambs, the Paschal Passover lambs would be slaughtered there and sacrificed. Interior, interiorly, uh, we have incense being offered up uh, to Yahweh, although no self-respecting Jew would have even pronounced his name that way. Uh, you can kind of understand how Catholicism sort of appropriated a lot of this symbolism. Uh, when I was a little boy, uh, you know, maybe 60 years ago, the Roman Catholic mass still required there, the, there to be a priest figure, a priestly figure, uh, because priests are always involved in sacrifice. He would be adjacent to an altar. An altar is a place of sacrifice. And you see how this in this illustration, which is really historically fairly accurate, You've got the priest looking at an object called a tabernacle. The, the word tabernacle means tent. How do we know it's sacred? <laughs> it's got the little gable thing, right? Uh, and in the Catholic imagination, uh, the remnants from the mass, the consecrated bread used for the Eucharist or communion, uh, 
is placed in this tabernacle, in this tent. And, and think about it logically. If Catholic Christians believe that Christ is the new covenant placed in this ark, that's comparable to God from the old covenant placed in the ark in the temple in Jerusalem. You can also understand, though, why, from a Protestant perspective, this all smacks of a lot of paganism. Here's a, here's a Roman edicula that sure looks a heck, a lot, heck of a lot like that tabernacle we just saw. When I was a little boy, sometimes there would also be something called a tabernacle veil that would be uh, connected to the tabernacle itself. This is kind of a neat little tabernacle that's got the words sanctus, sanctus, sanctus written above it in that little frieze, that little architrave. Um, some people might think that's my name. Well, my name means from the saints. This sanctus, sanctus, sanctus means holy, holy, holy. Uh, Jews would say, Kadosh, Kadosh, Kadosh Adonai, Holy, Holy, Holy Lord. You've heard that prayer before. The Lord was so holy that he, we, we were, were three times removed from him. And you know that there was a beautiful, uh, very large uh, screen, right, or veil that was in the, the temple in Jerusalem as well, that prevented the high priest from really looking upon the presence of the Lord uh, in that ark. And you tell me, even though sometimes it's hard for me to hear exactly what you folks are saying. What happened to that temple veil in Jerusalem, in the temple, the moment that Christ died for our sins? Ripped Anybody? Into. Ripped in two. Ripped in, yeah, ripped in two, right? And, and, um, but the gospel writer gives us some really interesting details, right? The gospel writer makes it really clear that it was ripped either from the top to the bottom or from the bottom to the top. Do you remember which direction it was ripped in? Top to the bottom. Top to the bottom. What does that imply? Because the thing was about 40 feet tall. That only God the Father could have ripped that thing. Can you imagine that? God uh, emptying his temple of its sanctity, which I always used to explain to my students by using the physics of a balloon, right? If you've ever let the air out of a balloon, everything that's originally inside the thing has to end up outside. And that's what happens to the temple in Jerusalem in the person of Jesus Christ, or to all of those old temples that were built by the people who uh, had their cultures and cultivated their traditions before the birth of Jesus. In the Roman tradition, and this was a temple I showed you last time, if you wanted to have contact with the sacred, you had to go to the, the temple. The temple was a container, a containment of the sacred. Everything outside of the fanum, I told you, was profanum or profane. But in the person of Jesus, this tradition comes to an end, right? Think of it this way. Jesus sort of makes the sacred portable. Because in our imaginations, our Christian imaginations, Jesus is the high priest. He is the sacrificial lamb. He's the paschal lamb. And he's the temple all in one. And what I love about this Christ, I'll tell you a little about my own my own faith. I love the fact that he brings the sacred to the wrong people all the time, doesn't he? He, he has dinner with the wrong people, with sinners. He hangs out with people of, of the wrong race. He brings the sacred to the world around us. And uh, this is the Christ you people profess. I listened to you last weekend. You, you sang this hymn at the very beginning. It's also in my hymn, believe it or not. You said aloud, not just in buildings small and confining, not in some heaven light years away, but here in this place, a new light is shining. Now is God present. Imagine that, God present to us now in this day. That's a pretty profound, pretty radical expression of faith. I sometimes think that we Christians forget how radical our imagination is or our sense of Christ really is. Uh, we become so accustomed to hearing all of these words or reciting the contents of the creed that we, we forget how radical our faith truly is. Um, you remember the St. Paul, for example, brilliant guy, right? Speaks 10 different languages and floats all over the world. He goes to places like, uh, like Greece. He speaks Greece fluently, Greek fluently. And he says, you know, the God who made the world and everything in it doesn't live in temples made by human hands. He goes to Athens, right? You've read about this in scripture, and he, he sees all of these shrines, all of these temples, all of these tents set up. He says, you, you Athenians, you Greeks are so pious, you even have a, a temple set up to an unknown God. 
that's how many insurance policies you've uh, you've taken out on life beyond the grave. But but I'm here to tell you that you use yourselves are God's temple. God resides in all of you. And I'm always um, kind of humbled by this phrase. I think about people in my own congregation. We're very pious towards God, very deferential toward Christ inside our church building. And then we leave the service and we run each other over in the, in the parking lot with our cars, forgetting that <laughs> I bet it never happens in Manhattan Beach, right? <laughs> Thomas Merton, the great American Catholic uh, Trappist monk and priest said that if we took our baptism seriously, as Christians, we'd probably get over most of our problems. We should genuflect toward each other as we come into a place of worship out of deference for the Christ who resides there. And even if you forget everything I just told you, when you get the Christmas cards in a couple of months that have this wonderful painting um, on the front cover uh, from the Renaissance period, this is Botticelli's uh, nativity scene, and I know that the details are hard for you to see, but the Holy Family is there in the very center. The Christ child is sitting on, on his mother's lap. St. Joseph is, is seen standing beside Mary. And uh, here's another sort of value added detail. You see Joseph, he's got white hair and a white beard. In the Catholic imagination of the Renaissance, certainly Joseph was always depicted as an old geezer, an old man. And you ask yourself, well, why? Why would he be depicted that way? Because scripture doesn't tell us anything about Joseph's age. But you see what that does? That allows the painter to prove the important theological point being made by this painting, that Joseph couldn't possibly be the biological father of the Christ child. There must have been a higher power. It must have been the Holy Spirit who somehow mystically, magically inseminated that virgin and brought the word into her womb and made the, the, the word become flesh. Not that, that older gentleman we see there, but, but look at the building, the barn, the structure in which the nativity occurs. It's an old decrepit Roman temple. It's got those nice trusses up there that probably would be surmounted by a pediment. It's a sacred space. And so in this one postcard, this one Christmas card, this one painting, you have a really uh, heady theology. It says that in the person of Jesus Christ, the temple tradition comes to an end. And, and also think about how you celebrate Christmas Eve at your congregation, in your congregation, or celebrate the whole feast of the nativity. Uh, we, we read from the prologue of John, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us. Pretty profound, right? Remember how I've been mentioning that temples are really symbols of tents? In the original rendering of this text, the words said, the word became flesh and pitched his tent among us. Isn't that remarkable? And the, flat, the tent was made out of this stuff. It was made out of human flesh. Christ assumes this flesh, he intents himself and tabernacles himself and comes to dwell with all of us. But isn't it interesting that of all the places where Jesus of Nazareth could have begun his ministry, he doesn't really begin it at the temple. Right? He goes to the temple, and he clearly cares about the temple because he cleansed it one time. Instead, he begins his public ministry in a synagogue, which means we have to do a little homework about synagogal architecture, because it, too, has an influence on your own piety there in Manhattan Beach, believe it or not. And by the way, I have to hand it to you. I saw that recently you folks have been involved with ecumenical services um, supporting the local Jewish community. And there's been some anti-Semitic activity since January in the area. Interestingly, in my own parish, I'm hosting as a facilitator an event on November 16th, dealing with exterior violence being done to uh, communities of, of religious conviction. So uh, this is a problem that we're experiencing all over the country. And certainly as the country becomes increasingly secularized, uh, the church is going to have to come to some pastoral grips with, do we keep our doors open or, or do we lock our doors in order to protect our people, property, and, and so forth. But um, here's a photograph of a fancy sort of European synagogue, probably from the 18th century, 19th century. See how it's got pews down below where people can sit, where, where the men can sit? It's got a gallery up above where uh, women would have been um, sort of sequestered at the time. 
I want you to kind of sear this into your imagination because here's a first generation Protestant place of worship here in the States, here in America. And in many ways, Protestantism, which is the tradition that you folks come out of or have chosen, Protestantism did its darndest to turn church architecture into synagogal architecture. A synagogue above everything else is a, is a classroom. It's a place where the synagogue, where the congregation assembles in order to hear the word of God, be close to the word of God, because Christ is present in, in the word. And in terms of plan, you're looking down again on a synagogal space. Uh, the dominant appointment in that space would have been something called a bema or a bema, depending upon how you spell or transliterate that word. I bet a lot of Roman Catholics would be surprised to know that in contemporary Catholic architecture, the floor on which an altar is built is called a bema or a bema. And then just as you have a tabernacle in a Catholic place of worship, in a synagogue, as many of you know, and I guess you've been to local synagogues as parts of services and ecumenical services, you know, there's a beautiful cabinet called the Ark, like the Ark of the Covenant, that contains the Torah, Torah scrolls. What I really want to show you, though, is how the interior disposition of this uh, synagogue would, would uh, be presented or how people would congregate in this space. Keeping in mind, of course, that Judaism was a patriarchal culture, right? Uh, even though Judaism is passed on through the mother's line, through the female line, men certainly had a superior status over women. So in a synagogue space, uh, Jewish men would sit in the front of that space or on the right, keep that in mind, and the women would be asked to sit on the left or sometimes in the front, or more often women would be asked to sit behind men or they would be sequestered or sent to galleries up above the men, like the galleries I showed you a couple of seconds ago. And uh, that bima that you see at the center, in some ways has the same disposition as the pulpit that I've seen in your church. You folks have a pretty significant pulpit. Right? And I can imagine Mike, uh, Pastor Mike, putting his hands on that pulpit. It's, it's a big sculptural presence, a big boxy kind of object that, if nothing else, declares to everybody that the word of God is important. And I don't know, on your screen, is, uh, is my little center of the synagogue kind of pulsing a little bit? Can you see it? That's just to point out that in the synagogue imagination or the imagination of the Jewish people, God is present to his community and the proclamation of the word. You know, you know in our, our Catholic tradition, whenever we read the gospel, we always kiss the book of gospels first, right? Just to show everybody how important that word is. It's, in fact, it's not a book, it's a person, right? Well, you know that in the uh, Jewish tradition, they always kiss the Torah scrolls or they kiss the menorah, which is partly scripture attached to the doorposts of their homes. And it would have been something like this. Again, given the fact that in the patriarchal culture, men have a superior position over women, uh, you, unfortunately, you daughters of Eve have to pay the price for, for Eve's great offense, right? The men were on the right side of the synagogue and the women on the left. Now, why do I bring that up? Because from this point forward, you and I have to be really attentive to right-sidedness as opposed to left-sidedness. Because in our Western imagination, the left and the right are not treated equally. And it shows up in our Christian way of doing things. I mean, how many times have you and I have been to a wedding and we're met at the front doors by the attendants and they ask us, are you with the bride side or the groom side, right? The groom side is always on the right the bride side is always on the left. And we don't even think about that. Where did that come from? Well, I'm telling you, it came from our Jewish brothers and sisters. Or think of it this way. If you go to a Roman Catholic place of worship, even a contemporary one, and here's one I found online recently. Uh, it's In the Catholic tradition, we love to have a statue of Mary, the mother of Christ, and Joseph, Jesus's foster father, if you want to call him that. She, uh, Joseph is always on the right, the superior side, the male side. Mary's always on the left, the inferior side. Or think of it this way. Whenever you see a painting of the Annunciation, this incredible story of the Archangel Gabriel visiting Mary, Mary's been reading the word of God, and, and that word literally becomes the baby growing in her womb. Uh, 
Mary is always placed on the right, the superior side. The Archangel Gabriel, even though he's a, an archangel, he's always on the inferior side. He's always on the left. And, and you know this from high school Latin class, right? Uh, anybody remember the, the Latin word for left? Sinistra. Oh, you guys are great. Optime, optime. You're great. Right. And we, we still sort of think of the left as being sinister, don't we? Um, I know uh, at the university, we have those like uh, collegiate uh, level uh, chairs that the kids sit in that has the tablet attached to the chair. The tablet is always, the ledger is always on the right. The assumption being that normal people write with their right hands. It's only the sinister left-handed people who uh, might uh, use their, their left hand. And we, we, in the old days, we used to correct for that. Uh, think about it this way, the story of the, the good thief, the good thief who uh, is crucified adjacent to Jesus. He's on the right side of Christ. And zip, he goes right into the heavenly Jerusalem upon his death. Or think about the creed that we sometimes recite as Christians. We say Jesus sits at the right hand of the Father. Sometimes my students say, Dr. DeSanctis, why can't he sit anywhere he wants to? He is God, right? Well, he sits at the right hand side to remind us of how significant he is. The, the right is always superior to the left. Keep that in mind, all right? Now, this Jesus figure doesn't spend all of his time in the synagogue either. He's constantly feeding people with himself and with food. There was a wonderful book that was written several years ago called Dining in the Kingdom of God, where the author talks about the number of times Jesus in, uh, during his ministry is feeding people through uh, himself, letting people devour himself, but also devouring a meal. Now, again, in my classroom, I have a real problem with this today because not only are the students unchurched, but they're also untabled. I can't tell you how many students don't regularly experience a, a, a formal meal at a table in their homes, even on something like Christmas. Over and over again, my students tell me, yeah, I got together with my mom. I come from a broken family. We, we sort of watched television and we, we had um, TV trays and we sort of ate a little. We nibbled on some food during Christmas. They, they've lost the sense of the meal symbolism that is so central to Christian tradition, Christian iconography. And the kind of meal, of course, that Jesus would have experienced eventually gets handed down to something we call the house church experience, the house church tradition. This mosaic from about the fifth century shows you the way Jesus and his followers would have actually shared a meal with each other. And remember how when you and I were young, we would talk about having company. Company would come to our home and we would share a snack with them or a meal with them. That phrase company comes from the Latin phrase companis, which means with bread. Company are those folks with whom we break bread, we share bread. Uh, look at Christ. Christ is raising his right hand in benediction. He's blessing the meal. This must be the meal at Emmaus, which is a fantastic story, isn't it? He, he's just, uh, he's, he's destroyed death. He walks through a door. His disciples are having a fish, and, fish dinner. He breaks bread with them. And look how close the disciples are to each other. Look at the intimacy depicted here. I mentioned that to you because so often in our contemporary Christian imagination, we fall back on the images that came to us from the Renaissance period. Here's a typical depiction of the Last Supper, for example. And uh, we see Christ holding up a modern version of a Eucharistic host that any Catholic of the period would have recognized. But they're all sitting there at a picnic table. Or how about an image like this from the Northern uh, Renaissance period, where we have a very recognizable Christ sitting there with beautiful place setting in a uh, middle-class um, uh, household from uh, Netherlands, perhaps. Well, we know from historical archeological uh, tradition or research that the kind of dining that Jesus would have involved himself in had nothing to do with those sorts of things. In every Roman house, in every Roman influenced home in Palestine where Jesus was, there would have been a special room or an upper room, a dining room called the triclinium. And the name literally means a place where there would have been found a three-sided uh, three dining configuration. Remember those of you who took Latin in high school, the IUM tag means a place in which 
and that clean a part of the word means a bed. That's where we get the word clinic from. Clinicians are people who work in places with lots of litters, lots of beds. So a triclinium was a room in which there was a three-sided dining table. There were mattresses there, uh, beanbag chairs there. And so we see, for example, that in a rendering like this, Jesus celebrating the Passover feast, the Pesach, that pre, uh, prefigures his own crucifixion and makes it clear to his disciples that he is going through this sacrificial act on their behalf. If you go to the catacombs, you find that this is the way the Last Supper, for example, is depicted over and over and over again. There's this sort of centralized uh, version of uh, the Last Supper scene. And, uh, and the folks, the apostles and Jesus are all dipping into that meal with their right hand. Uh, the left hand, even in Muslim territories today, is reserved for the bathroom and bathroom activity. So only the right hand gets dipped into that meal. And in this case, look at Judas. Judas is premature. He's the first to grab that, that Eucharistic meal being presented to him. And so in the early church, for those followers of uh, those first generations of followers of Jesus, the house church, as it was called, um, was made up primarily of a table. It wasn't even imagined as an altar at that point. And you had to have somebody overseeing the event. He was called the Episcopos. And he was a he, because again, these early Christians were part of a patriarchal culture. That word Episcopos obviously is the origin of our word Episcopal, which means bishop. And kind of look at it literally. Epi in Greek means over, and skopos means seer. So the Episcopos, the bishop, was an overseer. He was the overseer of the community. In Latin, he would have been called supervisor, right? The supervisor. And then the community would gather around the table. They would literally gather around the table, so much so that they eventually assumed this title. Uh, early Christians like to call themselves circumstantes. They're the people who literally gather around the table of the Lord, just as you folks in Manhattan Beach gather around the table of the Lord. And this is why I told you last week in passing that the earliest followers of Jesus never called their churches the house of God. That smacks too much of temple architecture. It was the house of the church, the domus ecclesiae, the domus, the house of those who are called together to be members of Jesus' body. And in fact, there was a critic of early Christianity who lived in the second century. He said, you know, you Christians are so primitive, you don't even have altars or temples the way we Romans do. And another third century uh, Christian theologian sort of bragged about that. You're right. We Christians have a horror of temples and altars and images. We're ready to die rather than profane our conception of God by doing what is forbidden. Of course, the nice thing about a house church like this is you can tear down its walls. You can still have the, the human body of Christ, the assembly gathered around the table, and you can build different kinds of configurations around that central assembly because it's the assembly itself, which is the body of Christ, the presence of Christ, not the church building. And you can play around with different geometric shapes. Remember how when you and I were in grade school, I guess, we learned about something like a, a plant cell. Plant cell has a nucleus at the center of it and has both a cell wall and a cell membrane. Well, the early Christians never had microscopes and didn't know anything about that kind of biology, but what we call double-shelled early Christian church architecture takes on the shape of a plant cell. The altar is at the center, and there's a, something called an ambulatory that allows people to walk all the way around the central altar. If you go to Rome, if we go to Rome together, I'll point out to you some wonderful buildings like San Stefano Rotondo. And even the name implies that it's round, it's a, it's a rotunda, and people congregate around a central altar. It might be a little bit difficult to see this situation, but here's the altar adjacent to that altar cross, and then that ambulatory that allowed people to walk all the way around or congregate all the way around the altar. That's why I sometimes have to laugh at my fellow Roman Catholics, who know very little, I have to say, about their own tradition. They look at the kinds of Catholic churches that have been co constructed since the 1950s and they throw up their hands and they say, oh my goodness, those churches are so Protestant. Well, where do you think the Protestants got the concept from? They got it from the early 
tradition of putting the altar, the table at the center. And those silly Catholics don't even realize that the greatest, largest church building in their tradition is a centralized space. Those of you who've gone to, uh, been lucky enough to go to Rome, you know that when Michelangelo designed St. Peter Basilica, he put the high altar right smack in the middle of the centralized space above the burial place of St. Peter, ostensibly. And you say to yourself, well, Michael, that, that makes so much sense. A centralized church like that that allows people to gather around uh, the central table. Why didn't we hold on to that more, more uh, tightly? In the Byzantine tradition, they did. In the Orthodox tradition, they did. Why is it that even in Manhattan Beach, we worship in a church building that's elongated? It has a longitudinal plan to it as opposed to a centralized plan. Well, we can lay the blame at uh, Constantine the Great, okay? Constantine, as you know, didn't simply legalize our faith, Christianity, in the fourth century. He was kind of singularly responsible for promulgating the idea that Christ was this great imperial king. See him here sitting on this great throne, this great uh, cathedra, uh, and you can see the Greek letters there are adjacent to his head, Jesus Christus. Here's Jesus Christ. And yet I don't think the real Jesus of Nazareth ever walked around ancient Palestine wearing gowns like that, right? And holding the word of God on his lap. And so the Christians of the fourth century had a real predicament. How were they going to find a church architecture large enough to accommodate the increased numbers of people coming together for worship, but also a God who's an imperial figure, an imperial God? And they found the solution in something called the Basilica. How are we doing for time? I have a couple of more minutes before you folks have to go worship. Is that the deal? Yes, five minutes. How five. many minutes? Five. Five. Oh, cinque. Cinque minuti. Fantastic. Let's do this. Let me take you to a place in Germany, actually, where they have a beautifully preserved basilica that is nowadays used as a Lutheran place of worship. When you and I hear the word basilica today, we typically think of a sacred space, but basilicas were not sacred buildings for the Roman people. And even before we talk about that a little bit further, have you ever used this little fragrant leaf in anything you've ever cooked? We love basil, right? We love pesto. We love things that are made out of uh, recipes that depend upon basil. The word basil, basilico in Italian, means something royal, something special, something fragrant. A basilica was a royal court of law. It was a, a, um, a, a court building, a court uh, place, a uh, place for legal activity. And this is the way it worked. It was a big old rectangle that had a semicircular niche at one end or both ends. Uh, it's called an apse, like the word synapse, which we learned about in high school biology. And then sitting in that apse, there would have been a judge called a praetor. The praetor would have known that across the way, there would have been a big statue of the emperor to remind him of his, his power. And you see those little squares that I have there at either end? Those are altars of sacrifice or altars for incense that would have um, uh, been places where incense would have been burned to remind us of the importance of the emperor, who was thought to be divine, and the origin of the, the judge's uh, power. And then there would have been something I used to call to my students, a picket fence in the middle of that building that was responsible for crowd control or the movement of people through the middle of that building. It would have looked something like this. If you and I had legal problems, we would go to the center of this space and then eventually be invited to go to the other side of that picket fence where we would address uh, a, um, a judge. The judge would sit in that big chair, which symbolizes his authority, and he would down a hand down a judgment according to Roman law. Well, the Christians of the fourth century said, well, wait a second, this is perfect. Because after all, a priest is a judge in a sense because he represents Christ. And Christ uh, is a, has a priestly uh, characteristic or, or role. Why don't we put our bishops in that semicircular apse space and appropriate the basilica to our worship? So this is what happened. The genius uh, Christians of the fourth century took the Roman basilica. They first of all said to themselves, well, we don't believe in that God figure, that uh, pagan God, and we don't need the incense altar. We'll get rid of those things. 
will attach an atrium to the basilica, like the atriums in our house that always have a little bubbly kind of fountain. We'll take the altar where incense was burned. We'll drag it across the cord of the apse closer to the bishop's place. And we'll put the choir up front. And you see how I sank the choir in purple up front in uh, this basilica? That's actually one place where Protestantism took the idea that the choir should be in the foreground of the worship space as opposed to the background. If that shape looks vaguely familiar to all of you, it's because when we were kids and we learned hopscotch, we were basically tracing the steps of a basilica. Nobody ever thinks about that at all. And this becomes the basis for church architecture for the next 1500 years. You've got men on one side, lay people on one side, you've got lay women on the other side, and the clergy who have the best places in the house, they get to sit in the middle. If that all looks vaguely familiar to you, it's because it's a reiteration of what I just showed you in the Jewish synagogue. We, we've borrowed so many, so many ideas from our Jewish brothers and sisters. Here's an image of a, uh, an Episcopus a bishop preaching to the men down below and the women up above in this kind of a configuration. And you can see how that becomes the germ for the kind of architecture that continues to develop throughout the Middle Ages. We put some arms on a basilica, made it into a cruciform structure. We made it more and more elaborate over time so that by the 13th, 14th century, our church buildings, which were cruciform or cross-shaped, began to look like these elaborate versions of the basilica. I just popped into my little plan here, uh, something called a rood screen, which I mentioned to you before. A rood screen was literally a wall, a perforated wall that divided the area where the lay people hung out from the area where the clergy hung out. We call it a rood screen because the word rood related to the word rod means a cross, and it was always surmounted by a cross. How many of you watched uh, the Queen's funeral a couple of weeks ago, right? The only reason why you and I sitting here in the States had such good seats is because there was a television crew on the other side of this big golden rood screen at Westminster Abbey Church in London. The rest of that crowd there, all dressed in black, they're sitting in the nave of the building and looking toward each other. Unfortunately, what this tended to do was to divide the church into two bodies, the lay people and the clergy, divided by that rood screen. And what happens in the, in, let's go forward, yeah. What happens in the 16th century, as you all know, is that there comes into our story great thinkers like these two gentlemen who ask themselves a logical question. Is it really appropriate for the body of Christ to be divided into two groups, lay people and clergy? What I'd like to do next week when we come together is to talk about what's happened to church architecture since the time of the Reformation, even into our own time, and the extent to which we both hold on to tradition and reject some of the traditional elements that I've shared with you already. Again, today, that's a lot of information. You'll be tested on all of this, but um, thanks for your patience. I wish I could worship with you right now in real time, real space, but I promise to watch you online, okay, and to pray for you with my intercessory prayers. Thanks for being so patient.